Any changes today? The younger security officer, Zack, asked as he stepped into the watchtower. As if, replied his superior, a jaded, cynical old man who insisted on being referred to as Mr. Jefferson. The darn thing hasn't moved, spoken, or done so much as stretch one of those wings of his. Another day at the office, then, Zack jumped. Through the window, the pair of them looked through at the towering figure a few kilometers away. SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, stood motionless, its fiery sword in its hand, ever protecting its post at the precipice between our world and paradise. It had long been stationed at the entrance of a dimensional gateway that led to what was believed to be the Garden of Eden, described in the Biblical Old Testament. Much like the security officers in the Foundation's base tasked with watching the Guardian, this was pretty much the extent of the day's activities. Hey, did you see that news about the uh, transfer posting? Zack asked, trying to stave off boredom with as much conversation he could squeeze out of his fellow officer. Yeah, I saw it. Mr. Jefferson scoffed, rolling his eyes. What possesses someone like Robert Montauk to come down here? Eh, must have wanted a quieter post, Zack reasoned, looking out at the stillness of the Gate Guardian. Won't find one any quieter than here, Jefferson mused. Him showing up will be the most exciting thing that's happened here in a long while. Unbeknownst to both Zack and Mr. Jefferson, Dr. Robert Montauk would be only joining the team at the Gate Guardian observation site for a short while. Not one of them, nor anybody else within the Foundation, could ever guess Montauk's true intentions behind venturing there in the first place. He wanted an audience with the Gate Guardian itself. Approaching the colossal thousand-foot-tall being, Dr. Montauk crossed the threshold of the minimum safe distance from the Guardian. Given the sheer heat of its weapon, hotter than Earth's sun, anything within a kilometer of SCP-001 was at risk of being obliterated, vaporized into atoms if they didn't turn back. Which, through a voice that immediately rang out in Montauk's ears, the Gate Guardian commanded him to do. Leave. Its psychic message boomed. Wait, wait, Dr. Montauk urged, holding up his hands in what would have been a futile defense against the Guardian Sword. I know what you do when people don't listen to your commands, but please, just give me a minute. There was silence. SCP-001 didn't reply. There was nobody else close enough to hear Montauk speak to it. So, he continued. You are impossibly old. We know that much about you. And because of that, you must have seen things that we can't even begin to imagine, much less fully comprehend. But I've come a very long way to request that you impart some information to me, if you can. He paused again, as if waiting for a reply that never came. The Gate Guardian merely stood in the same defensive, unwavering stance. Tell me, please, how much do you know about the Scarlet King? By this point in time, although the Foundation was yet to realize, Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly going insane. His investigations into an anomalous entity known as the Scarlet King were gradually corrupting him, as he tried relentlessly to quantify exactly what this entity was and how great of a threat it posed. Little did Montauk realize that, in trying so hard to define and comprehend the being, he was inadvertently fueling its power. The Scarlet King was an interdimensional warmonger, an embodiment of hatred and chaos, and Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly falling under the King's influence. Upon hearing the tiny human figure utter his question, the immense Gate Guardian rebuted with another single word psychic command, one it had never been recorded giving before. Witness! As if his increasing instability and the creeping influence of the Scarlet King hadn't made Montauk feel bad enough, he instantly felt sick. There was a searing pain behind his eyes, like he was staring directly at the sun, accompanied by a nausea that made his head spin. It took a moment of enduring the horrific sensation before he realized what was happening. The Guardian was trying to show him something. Rather than give any information on the Scarlet King verbally, SCP-001 was imparting a psychic vision onto Montauk, a memory of events long past, the answers he sought, a warning, or perhaps all three. The vision showed Montauk a time so long ago that it couldn't ever be forgotten, for there was barely anyone alive to remember it in the first place. It was eons in the past, long before the comparatively recent dawn of humanity, a time only spoken of in the Dust and Blood tablet an artifact of the Davite civilization, 
some of the earliest worshippers of the Scarlet King himself. And there, marching up to the entrance of Eden, was the crimson-clad Eldritch Abomination and a horde of horrors with him. According to the story recorded in the Dust and Blood Tablet, this would have been much earlier in the life of the Scarlet King, perhaps even before he assumed his now infamous title. Back then, he would most likely have been known as his original name of Kanthrak, one of multiple siblings born when the Tree of Life was planted, and thus created all life in the multiverse. But being the only one of his siblings cursed with awareness, knowing the pain his existence brought him, Kanthrak would eventually set out on his lifelong mission to destroy all of existence across every dimension. And he started by killing his siblings, consuming them to claim their power for himself. Around this time in prehistory, the being that would one day become known as Scarlet King didn't quite possess the power that he would several millennia later. Although that's not to say he was an unformidable force of destruction, fueled by his singular hatred for existence. His vow to destroy extended to the Tree of Life that had caused him to be, along with the tree's creator and all of their creation. In other words, everything in the multiverse, all of creation, if you will. So what was the Scarlet King doing there so long ago, at the dimensional doorway protected by the Gate Guardian? Well, beyond the boundary, between it and the rest of the infinite multiverse, lay the supposed Garden of Eden. While it is unknown if it is, in fact, the same Eden referred to in the Book of Genesis is up for debate, especially among the Foundation. But at a glance, even through the gate, it certainly does look like a paradise. The space is filled with lush vegetation of astronomical size, populated by a number of beings that seem to resemble the Gate Guardian itself. And there, protected by its watchful caretaker, are two trees. One is thought to be the Tree of Knowledge, that Eve was tricked into eating an apple from during the Book of Genesis. The other, however, bears an unknown type of fruit, and is widely believed to be the Tree of Life. Now back in the modern age, there's never been a conclusive link between the Tree of Life mentioned by the Davites and their barbaric civilization's legends regarding the creation of the Scarlet King, but the fact that so long ago he and his most feared generals were bearing down on the Gate Guardian's position, defending a garden where there was known to be a tree of that description, well, it all seems rather conclusive now. Alongside Kaharak were six of his seven daughters, each one of them a fearsome abomination much like their destructive father. As they approached, not one needed to exchange any words with their angelic protector of Eden. The Gate Guardian knew what these monsters were here for. They would stop at nothing to pass through his gate and uproot the Tree of Life, the progenitor of all living beings in all of existence. Even though it was early in Kathrak's career as the rampaging interdimensional warlord he so is, he was as steadfast as ever in his goal to annihilate every corner of creation, every dimension, every parallel plane of reality, every single pocket of existence across infinity. They'd all come undone if he burned the tree of life, pulled it out at the roots, and splintered it until nothing remained. To the once and future Scarlet King, that the same tree had led to his own tortured existence, it was the source of his suffering, and it had to be destroyed. The only thing standing in his way was a figure as colossal as Kamharak himself, wielding a flaming sword. Leave! Boomed the psychic voice of the Gate Guardian. It was like a doorman standing before a group of rowdy teenagers trying to force their way into a movie theater. Except these rowdy teens were the Scarlet King, his horrifying daughters, and the forces he had already amassed since his creation. The horde stood ready, waiting for the commands of their king, who they thought would gladly lead the charge as they marched on the Garden of Eden to begin the destruction of existence. But that's not what happened. Usually, the Scarlet King would never shy away from a fight, preferring to lead the charge when it came to a slaughter. Instead, he commanded his first daughter, Ativik, to commence the first attack on the protector who stood in their path. On her foul father's word, Ativik took her horde and charged at the Guardian. What she and her forces lacked in numerical advantage, Ativik more than made up for in her knowledge of war. She hungered for it, sought dominion. That was her seal, after all. And yet, in the face of this impending onslaught, the Gate Guardian remains still, rooted to the same spot it had as always, and would always be standing in. 
A number of Ativik's minions burst into flames. The very fabric of their crude form separated on a molecular level as they were effortlessly rendered into nothingness. Still, the Gate Guardian hadn't appeared to move an inch, had exerted no energy, despite the damage it had done to Ativik and her forces in defense of Eden. As his first daughter screeched and howled in despair at the decimation of her horn, her children, the Scarlet King decided he needed to better understand his opponent. With a wave of his clawed crimson hand, the king commanded his next daughter, Aghor, to send forth her own army. In a tidal wave of nightmarish creatures, Aghor sent her horrific children into battle. She possessed a far greater quantity to do battle on her father's behalf. Perhaps Aghor even believed that was the Scarlet King's plan. With a greater number of her forces over her sisters, maybe she would be able to overwhelm the Guardian. But even as her own children began to be vaporized the closer that they got to the gate, Aghor had no idea she was little more than a pawn being sacrificed so that Kanra could learn more about his imposing angelic enemy. Another of the Scarlet King's daughters, a being known as Anhwit, was the next called up to contribute to the unfolding battle. Although, to call it a battle undersells just how easily the Gate Guardian seemed to be eliminating the oncoming forces without even moving. While an outwardly frail-seeming creature, Anhuit's primary strength over her sisters was a proficiency in magic, her innate ability to warp and reshape reality around her. It was that power that had caused her father to be wary of her, viewing Anhuit's abilities as a threat to his leadership. And so, Kantrak had her crippled and all her children, leaving them unable to overthrow him, but still loyal to their king. Obeying her father's command, perhaps out of the same loyalty or fear that he would harm her and her children further if she disobeyed, Anhuit unfurled her magic. She reshaped the world around them, making it so that the passage of time moved so much slower. And that was what revealed to the Scarlet King his enemy's greatest strength in combat. The Gate Guardian had so far been able to obliterate both Ativik and now Akhor's forces without seeming to move, but it wasn't by standing still. It was moving, just much faster than the blink of Scarlet King's multiple eyes. Now that Anhuit's magic had slowed the passage of time, the Gate Guardian could be seen doing battle. As Akhor's atrocities spilled towards the Angel to try and overwhelm it, it effortlessly blocked the oncoming attacks with its sword. Everything the Flaming Blade connected with instantly evaporated, bursting into atoms as they were practically cleaved out of existence by the Gate Guardian's mighty weapon. Even with time slowed to a crawl, the towering Winged Protector of Eden only appeared to be moving at an average speed. But when time flowed normally, without Anhuit manipulating reality, the Guardian was simply too fast to be observed. Resisting the urge to dive headfirst into the fight himself, the Scarlet King knew it would likely lead to his untimely demise. He refused to accept that. It could not happen. But he still had yet to amass the strength he would need as he continued his ascent. So while time was slowed to a crawl and the Gate Guardian was still engaged in combat with Aghoros' forces, he turned to another of his remaining daughters, Adista. If the Scarlet King and his forces couldn't get past the Guardian, they could still try to get to the Tree of Life while the Protector's focus was diverted. Adisat unleashed a wave of pestilence, sickness, and disease spewing from her in a cloud of vapor, heading straight towards the Angelic Garden and Eden's entrance beyond. The Scarlet King knew this latest attack wouldn't phase or weaken the Gate Guardian. He hoped the foul smog would instead pass through the gateway itself into the garden. As Adisat sent forth her power, blood and ash soaked the landscape around them. All the plants outside the entrance to Eden withered and died, shriveling and decomposing as the disgusting fog rolled towards the gate. It washed over the Guardian, whose form only seemed to glow brighter as he repelled the pestilence. It was as if it didn't even need to think about it, still focused on finishing off the rest of the oncoming army. As its glow intensified, so did the fiery sword that the Gate Guardian swung with ease and finesse. Flames burst from the blade, the encroaching fumes catching fire along with the air itself. It ignited in a wave of fire, a defensive inferno that repelled this latest attack. But for a brief few moments, while time stayed slow, before Anhuit's hold on reality inevitably broke, the king had sent forth Atilif. Of all his spawn, she was the most reserved, keeping mostly to herself, never speaking. 
She and her children could change their faces and forms, shift into anything or anyone, and walk undetected through the multiverse. And now her father was employing her incredible stealth abilities to slip behind enemy lines, while the Gate Guardian was finishing off the remaining onslaught from Kanhrak's other daughters. It was as Atilif drew near, creeping unseen closer and closer to the entrance, keeping the Scarlet King out of Eden, that the Guardian seemed to pause. It slowly, ominously turned its huge head, tilting until it was looking directly at Atilif. If its expression could be seen, maybe the Gate Guardian would almost be impressed that someone was able to sneak past it. After all, it was a feat that no other being in creation could ever hope to accomplish. But then again, with its steadfast conviction and dedication to its protective duty, maybe it would have looked upon Atilif with anger. With a cleaving swing of its scorching sword, the Gate Guardian unfurled a tidal wave of fire that engulfed everything around it. Not just Atilif, but Ativik, Aghor, and Adista, all the king's daughters that had attacked so far, along with every one of their own children, were instantly obliterated. They were all reduced to empty, vacant spaces where they had once been, their atoms separated by the searing swing of the Guardian's weapon. The devastating blow by his adversary did little to deter the Scarlet King from his mission. He was still set on destroying the Tree of Life, and no loss was too great in his pursuit of destroying existence. He barely cared that four of his own daughters had just been unmade by the Guardian. Anhuit was still there, clinging on to time as if it were a thrashing animal. The Scarlet King could simply make her restore her fallen sisters and their forces. He had lost nothing, but had held back for too long, and slowly drew his own weapon out of thin air. Wielding a sword that was as blood-soaked as the Guardian's was hot, the Scarlet King locked blades with the one being standing in their way. Both the ancient Angelic Defender and the attacking Eldritch Abomination were evenly matched. Every one of their vicious strikes against the other met with an equally strong parry. A weapon of extreme, all-consuming heat blocked swipes from a sharp, serrated edge that matched the deep red that would be forever synonymous with Kamprak. The force of their two swords clashing and striking each other was so great that it rippled out from their one-on-one -on -one fight. The landscape around them was flattened, wiped clean of any remaining plant life that hadn't already been destroyed by the forces of the king's daughters. Despite having acquired nowhere near the power he would thousands of years after this fight, the Scarlet King was still a formidable force in single combat, and yet the Gate Guardian seemed incapable of tiring or weakening, still standing strong against the onslaught. Even after wiping multiple armies out with its flaming sword, the Guardian was still able to hold its own against the Scarlet King, who was furious, enraged at being so close to the Tree of Life, yet unable to get past his angelic adversary. He'd need to be stronger, faster, even more ruthless than the warlord he already was. Despite Anhuit slowing down time, the King and the Guardian were at a stalemate. Time. That was it. The Scarlet King needed more time. Withdrawing from the fight, he realized that this was a battle that could not be won by sheer brute force alone. His mission to destroy all creation, to get to the Tree of Life, would take cunning, deception, and more time. If he let it, the Gate Guardian could easily kill Kantra. Its flaming weapon could cleave him out of existence, and that would end the King's torment. But it wouldn't be enough. A death would be unsatisfying knowing that the rest of existence would go on after he was gone. The Scarlet King couldn't accept that. It wasn't enough. So he did the one thing nobody would expect of him. He made a deal with the Gate Guardian. It was an action still fueled by his infinite hatred for all existence, his yearning for total chaos. The Scarlet King knew that one day, an event would arrive where the Guardian and the other beings like it in the Garden of Eden would spill forth and deliver judgment on this world. And when that rapture happened, the Tree of Life would be undefended. The Scarlet King bartered with the Guardian that he would retreat for the time being so he could spend eons amassing more and more power. Then, when the fateful day arrived, the Gate Guardian would allow him into Eden to destroy the Tree of Life, while it and its brethren were busy conducting the Rapture. Halting their fight, the Scarlet King offered a Crimson Claw to the Gate Guardian's burning hand. 
Returning to reality from the intense vision, still feeling sick at what he had witnessed, Robert Montauk looked up at the still, silent form of the Gate Guardian. Did you do it? He yelled, desperate to know more through his obsession with the Scarlet King. Did you tell him yes? Did you make a deal? There was no answer from the Guardian, just a single word that echoed through Montauk's fractured mind. Leave. Now go and check out SCP-001 The Scarlet King Dust and Blood and SCP-001 The Scarlet King Darth Vader Begs for Mercy for more of the multiverse's most monstrous monarch.